let's get to the reason we're all here tonight to hear from Rich Mirnov. I've uh, been happy to know Rich for a while now. Um, he's a product management coach and consultant. He was the product guy at Six Silicon Valley Startups. He's the author of the book that we gave away, The Art of Product Management, which is one of the earliest books in product management. Um, you can check out his helpful blog at Mirnov.com. And again, his Twitter handle is at Rich Mirnov. So I'm really excited to welcome Rich. We have just, we'll just a little fireside chat and then we'll open up for questions. So I think one of the, you know, this is great advice of how to think about each of the different functions. Um, one of the, the, I could see a PM perhaps who's not super senior saying, hey, what if I don't have the political cloud or organizational cloud to negotiate with these VPs and, and speak truth to power? What advice do you have for them, Rich? Well, gosh, you know, um, uh, in order of preference, right? So, um, the best answer is that you have a VP of product or chief product officer or somebody senior mm -hmm. who really understands this stuff and has the throw weight and clout to go into those executive meetings and fight for what we need. That's, that's the best answer. Um, if I, I observe that if there's nobody in the executive team who represents product, we have a really bad day almost every day, right? Um, so, you know, look around uh, sometimes, for instance, the chief financial officer or somebody on the finance side who really understands the business can be a supporter of ours. Sometimes marketing is with us on this, if, if, or certainly engineering. If, if you looked at the folks in your particular executive suite, who are your allies? Right. Who, who can we prep? Who can we get out ahead with, take out for beers, whatever it is, and get someone who's going to fight for real prioritization? Um, in a company that's purely sales led, the answer is whatever sales wants, sales gets. And, and that's just not a way to build software products unless you want to be a professional services firm. Right. Yeah. Well, actually, that's a good transition. One of the questions that I was going to ask was, you know, I think there's this interesting aspect of like, what's the balance of power? How much power does each org have? And sometimes you see companies that are sales driven, like you were just saying, where sure. sales has, you know, they don't necessarily call 100% of the shots, but they call way more shots than they probably should. Or other companies that are very engineering driven, where engineering has all the power. Sure. Um, so I'm just curious what you've seen on that front and what advice you have for PMs on how to deal with those kind of situations. Yeah, and, and every company has some shape, right? There are no two companies are the same. I'm sorry, it was uh, Tolstoy who opened Anna Karenina with the thought that happy families are all the same, but unhappy families are all unique in their unhappiness, right? Every company is different. They've got personalities. It's never the same. But um, I, I guess m my thought is product management is almost always on the other side of the scale. If it's too engineering driven, we end up having to drum up support from the rest of the company to balance out engineering. If it's too sales driven, we're working with finance and marketing and engineering to have a united front so that we're not just sales driven. Right. You know, it's, it, it's a power dynamic that, you know, I mean, that makes it sound bad, but real people and we've got to figure out what's going on and, and who's, on, who's going to be able to support the, the good of the company because almost all the departments are actually locally optimizing for their departmental goals. Product management is usually optimizing for customers and products and revenue at the company level. And so we got to figure out who else is on our team. It sounds like we're always on the resistance. We're always the underdogs. We're always well, helping the underdogs. You know, um, the, the reason that the uh, head of product job has such a half a short half-life is it's because we're always the resistance. We're always the naysayers. Uh, we're always yeah, the people yeah, yeah. who are coming yeah. in the meeting, yeah. not giving everybody what they want. And uh, 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 MTBE, mean time between executives, it's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty high on the product side. No, I gotcha. Well, I guess that kind of speaks to, we're kind of like, I, sometimes I use the term, we're the reality messengers. That's right. right? And some companies messengers. want to hear it and some don't. Some people want to shoot the messenger. I got you. That's, That's right. A good, yep. interesting point. All right, cool. Well, as a PM, you can often have many stakeholders and managers, not just two or three, but multiple ones. If you find yourself in a company where you have a lot of stakeholders, are there some tactics or ways to kind of differentiate or categorize them? Like which ones really matter and are more important and which ones are less important? Like, how do you think about that? Yeah, again, every company is going to be different. But for instance, I see a lot of e-commerce companies where the operations team really drives everything, right? We're shipping physical goods. The software is really supporting the business. It's not the business itself. And we're always running into problems where, you know, you order something, it comes in three boxes 
and we tell you when the first box arrived, but we're not really sure when the second and third one arrived. And then we get a lot of angry customer calls. So, you know, every company is going to have its own shape. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what, what I try to do is I try to identify the underserved or the undervoiced folks and give them a little bit of side room. So if, for instance, legal and compliance never gets to the table, but we're going to get a shutdown and our CEO is going to get arrested if we do some bad things, then I'm going to, I'm going to sneak over to the compliance and licensing and legal folks and sneak a couple of tickets in that are going to save the company and maybe not tell anybody else because if we raise the issue, then sales is going to decide that's not mm. important and we're going to drop them, right? So uh, in a lot of ways, this is like being a parent where you, know, you got to get the kids to eat their vegetables before dessert comes around and they're not always happy. But you know, it's our job to make sure we ship products that go to customers and they pay for them. And, and the intramural politics may be less important. Yeah, so it sounds like sometimes you have to ask for forgiveness instead of permission. Well, I try not to ask, <clears throat> go ahead. Yeah, right, right, yes. yeah, I got it. Just try to fly under the radar. I see Laura's had that same conversation. Keep going. Yeah. Got it. All right, cool. All right, cool. Well, um, what about when there's two important stakeholders and they just like, they disagree and you're kind of stuck in the middle or you're trying to move things forward? What advice do you have for that situation? Well, um, depends where you live. If, if you can send them off to the cage match for, you know, MMA, <laughs> then whoever wins, wins, right? But um, uh, that's really hard. Uh, you know, let's, let's play for a minute. Let's play um, marriage counselor here instead of decider. Right. So can we unpack what the issues are? Can we get them talking to each other? Can we suggest some trade offs? Uh, I don't know. Right. But, you know, if this ends up in shouting matches in the executive meeting, then we've kind of failed. Right? Yeah. So how, how do how do we be the coaches or mentors or psychiatrists for the rest of the executive team so that we don't get into this place so often now? If you, if you work at a company where the CEO had a bad childhood and every Tuesday and Thursday needs to prove to everybody else in the company that they're much more successful than their parents who are gone would have remembered them to be, um, I would go work somewhere else. But short of that, you know, how, how do we help our peers understand the, the real need and, and soften it up, help them negotiate with each other or find a way to split? Yeah. Well, this ties into something you had said at the very end about you think PMs, you know, need to be students of human behavior. So I'm just wondering what if someone, you know, says, yeah, that sounds good. I want to learn more about and get better at that. What advice or resources would you say? Here's what you should do to get better. Oh, there's a lot of things. I mean, you know, if you haven't been to the Myers-Briggs course or any of the 20 identical things where you learn that not everybody's like you, that's right. a start. Um, uh, anybody who hasn't been following Karen Catlin's best allies work, where she's got a lot, a lot of writing about how to listen to folks who don't speak up and may not be may not have a seat at the table. Um, uh, it, it's really about listening and leaving your ego at the door and watching the patterns, right? So you may not see it the first time, but when somebody misbehaves the same way four or five times, why are they doing that? How are they being paid? Or what's the incentive? Or how do you get promoted? Or are we hiring the wrong folks? You, you got to be analytical about what's not working. And I, I always try my best, and I don't always do it, but I always try my best not to have it be about the person, but about the role or the department, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. if everybody in sales is misbehaving, it's probably a compensation issue. If one person in sales is misbehaving, then I tell their boss to get rid of them. Right. Mm -hmm. But in general, what I see here is good people come into companies and they figure out what the reward system is. And it's often the wrong thing. So, you know, how do we understand behavior before we get angry at people? Yeah. And I think, yeah, incentives play into it. I think, in my mind, culture also impacts very much. Like what's very accepted? Much. What are the norms that are acceptable? What's That's right. When, 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 I, when I hear a CEO or a COO tell me that, all of the engineers are lazy and don't put in a full day's work. Uh, I, I tell all my recruiting friends because in eight more weeks, all of those engineers are going to be right because exactly. they don't want to stay. Right, right. Gotcha. Cool. Well, as I hear you talk about, I think the pie chart in the categories yep. is, is a helpful tool. As I hear you talk about that, you know, one way of viewing it is all right, we're kind of satisficing, we're dividing things up to be politically savvy. 
part of me as a PM, I'm like, gosh, could we somehow make this resource allocation like more directly aligned with what we as a product team believe will create the most customer value? Sure, so absolutely. I'm, and I'm sure some of it impinges on that. The question is how right. do we maximize how much the overlap sure. is, I guess, right? Right, and, and so let, let's talk about metrics for a moment here because the different slices have different metrics. Mm -hmm. So in the general features for the whole world that people ask for and they're gonna see, we're either doing short-term ROI or long-term ROI, depending on where we are in the, you know, in the, in the cycle. But the metric turns out to be, you know, reduced churn, which is money, or new mm -hmm. account, which is money, or new segments, which is money, or growth of accounts, which is money. And we're balancing short versus long-term, but we're pretty sure we know what, what, the, what the units are, right? But we can apply those same units to tech debt and outages and illities we're going to be in a whole world of hurt. So on that side, we're probably looking at some quality metrics, some very qualitative decisions on the engineering side about where they're getting stuck, um, tickets from the support team, right? So those are much more, um, they're quantitative, but or maybe they're not quantitative, but they're not about money. They're about product health, right? Mm -hmm. And on the learning side, honestly, it's really hard to measure learning. My thing is we just have to not give away that slice. We have to actually do real validation and discovery every single week. And we have to share with the company what we're learning or they don't understand, right? Mm -hmm. so, so we do apply ROI in the place where that makes sense. We do apply spreadsheets or tools where that makes sense, but only after we figured out what category they go with. One, one last thought there, it's really easy. Excel has this feature where you can show a number to 11 decimal places. Now it turns out your estimate for the revenue is 2 million plus or minus a million and a half either way, right? But the finance folks really want you to extend it out to 11 decimal places because for some reason they believe that our estimates are gonna be better if we show more numbers <clears throat> and don't fall into that trap, right? Um, I usually talk about count the digits. Is it a $5,000 opportunity, a $50,000 opportunity, a $500,000 opportunity? We probably can't tell the difference on those inputs between 100,000 and 220, and there's strategic issues that are going to drive that choice. But mm -hmm. we could certainly sort all the four-digit ones below all the five-digit ones and be mostly right because we're never going to do the four-digit ones, and it doesn't matter. Okay. Well, the other thing I could see is if you have a lot of stakeholders, I see some people, they're tempted to just kind of spread the resources roughly evenly. Okay, like round robin. Okay, we have six stakeholders. Each get one six of the pie. Yeah, and it uh, reminds me of the peanut butter memo, right? From that's Yahoo, right, exactly right. Like that's we, right. We're like we're yeah. spreading everything too thin, and we don't have any strategic focus. So how do you get guard against that? In, in right. Your so, dollars? so, so this is a this is a strategic question at the highest company level. For instance, if we're in market, and we're losing a lot of customers because our quality is terrible and our systems keep crashing, and they would love the product if it just worked. Right. Then I'm guessing that for the next quarter or two, we're going to shift that red slice to 60 or 65 or maybe 70 percent because otherwise we're out of business. Right. If if we're dealing with our if we're very early stage and we only have five customers, it's pretty hard to tell the difference between something one customer wants and something every customer wants because we don't have enough data. So early on, we're probably going to overweight toward believing our first five customers unless we know different. Right. Um, if if we haven't found product market fit, I really want to spend more than five percent on validation because otherwise we're going to close our company and all go home. So so this is a strategic evaluation of where the company is, and and we have to be brave and bold and have that argument. Right. If 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 our product doesn't work and we're signing up customers who all quit after two days because it doesn't work, it's the wrong time to invest in a bigger sales team. And it's the wrong right. time to invest in a bigger outreach and funnel if they're all falling out the bottom because our stuff is crap, right? And that's, again, that's a, that's a truth-telling moment at the executive team. Maybe we're scaling like crazy and the product's great. And now is the moment to put the next 15 million we raise into social media and sales. I don't know, right? But the, the pie charts aren't the same. They're a reflection of where our company is. And they, and they should ring true for the rest of the executive team. Yeah. Right? I have a default one, and that was the one I put up, but mm -hmm. there's no reason why your company is in that same place. Got it. Um, one, one last one, and, and, and I'll talk a little out of school here. But if, if the 
strategy is to be acquired by a professional, uh, by a private equity firm in the next six to 12 months, who's going to grade you on EBITDA and top line and don't care about anything else. Then we're going to hire cheaper folks and let a bunch of them go and pile up tech debt and cross our fingers and hope we get sold before it all comes home. <laughs> right. Um, this is a company strategy issue. It's not some generic, here's my pie chart. Everybody should use my pie chart. This is, this is big company thinking, right? Yeah. Well, along those lines of build on that, I mean, sometimes you're in situations where the CEO sees that and steps up and drives that process. And I've yep. also been in situations where the CEO does not, is, does not either proactively do that. So what, like, you know, and no one, like no one on the executive, everyone's just fighting for their part of yeah. the, the piece of cheese of the pie. Yep. So what do yep. you do as a head of product in those situations? Well, I think there's probably two situations there. One is often the executive team is just lacking the particular skills or the outlook or the tool or the understanding, right? That they want to do the right thing, but they don't know what it is. And then it's the head of products oh. or my job to educate them all. And by the way, you want to do that one at a time. I never want to embarrass executives in front of each other. So I'll schedule 45 minutes or an hour and a half or whatever it's going to take with each of them in turn. And I'll walk them through the thinking and I'll, and the, the best meetings there are where we've done the one with it's the shuttle diplomacy, right? We've done the one-on-one -on -one with every single executive team member. And then we actually have the meeting and it's a non-event because everybody around the table thinks it was their good idea. I don't care if it's my idea. I, I'll disavow, right? If everybody else thinks it's their idea, I've won. Right? right. And we'll get to an answer. Now, sometimes they're very resistant and I don't know what to do. Right. So I, I've done 13 or 14 of these interim VP product CPO jobs and about half of them were that way. And the answer is if the executive team doesn't want to be strategic and doesn't want to make decisions and can't decide, I can't make them. Right. Good thing. Good thing. I'm a short timer, but yeah. Right. It's kind of like, do you want to deal with reality and yeah, figure this right. out and, or not? And, 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 I, and I have a great, um, I have a benefit that, that full-time people don't have, which is if I know I'm there for the short term, I get to tell the truth in whatever format needs to be told because I'm not staying anyway and I'm not looking to make, I'm happy to make friends, but I'm not there to make friends or invest stock. If you're the full-time head of product or VP product, you know, you have to weigh your personal goals here and how aggressive you want to be because- right. You know, if, if you're too much in everybody's face and it's not that kind of company, well, then your successor gets to try again. Right, right, right. Yeah, gotcha. Cool. Well, and, um, one thing I want to pick up on is you mentioned, you alluded to this, hey, you've got like a, we come, we create a list of features and we run it through our special algorithm, you know, that sorts yes. them out. And we've spent a lot of time and effort. I've seen a lot of PMs try to have this spreadsheet with like the Uber algorithm and the yep, scores yep. and the weights. Sure. That's supposed to generate it. And, and as you kind of alluded, I've seen that not lead to not work super well, even though people want it to work super well. So I'm just wondering what advice you would give yeah. people that are trying to kind of algorithm, use algorithms. Yeah. Kind of I'm, I'm a big fan and, and, and you have uh, Josh Seiden and, and, and Jeff Gotthelp coming, right? I'm a huge fan of their work and everybody's work around outcomes. So, so I like to start my roadmap, not with features, but with what we're trying to accomplish. And then, and some of them, some of the features actually don't have a place there because they don't fit, right? Uh, and and it's, it's much less emotional to ask the question of, if we're trying to reduce churn by getting more of our customers onboarded well and getting them trained because that's the thing that causes them not to churn we can look at our features and other things and say well which things are going to get them onboarded or happy or using our features or up so, right we, we have a goal and and the the goals are i think much more powerful than looking at list of features my eyes just cross right so yeah. so what are what are the three big outcomes we're trying to push right now and What's our sense of which features, capabilities, and they may not even be features. Maybe it's an organizational thing or it's a training thing or it's a new department, right? We forgot to have a team that calls customers for renewals and we're having our, our regular sales reps do it and it doesn't work. Okay, maybe we should have a renewals department, right? That's not a technical feature, but as the person who worries about the health and safety of my product, the same way I worry about the health and safety of my daughter, 
right? I'm looking at the company trying to figure out what's broken and they're not all technical fixes. They don't have to be, right? Uh, I'm advocating, I'm the champion for the product, nothing else, right? The product and the user. Honestly, I couldn't care about the other departments unless they're helping. I will finish with the Tron quote. I fight for the user. Sounds good. Yeah. Cool. That's Tron for me. Yeah. I remember yeah. the original Tron. Yeah. Me too, but me too. It's a good movie. Tron 2, but it's a good sequel. Good sequel uh, too. Yeah, no. Okay. Well, Daft Punk at least. Come on. All right. We got one more. Yeah. I think we're good. We'll wrap it there. Let's go to audience QA. I think that's a good okay, point. Great. And um, I've got some questions here. So the way for audience QA, if um, I've got the questions here, I'll try to chat you, send you a private chat to give you a heads up to say, hey, you're coming up next. If you want to, it'd be great if you want to unmute and, and put your video on, you, I'll put you up here side by side so you can ask your question kind of face to face to Rich. So um, the first question we have from Teach, Teach Yalaman. I just moved on, Yalaman Chile, if you're there. Take um, yourself off mute, ask yeah, the question. Yeah, I just asked you to unmute, ask you to start video, so we'll see. And then uh, somebody else, thanks for sharing that chat. There we go. Go ahead, Teach. Hey, Rich. Right, hey, Dan. Good, good to see you guys again. Good to we've, see we've you. We've met a few times in the past. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, I had a question. You know, my current company, uh, you know, we're in a situation where it's it's still fairly small. They're still trying to find their way with regards to product organization. Um, it's not really a formal group yet within the company as the decision-making process is generally pretty heavy from the top down. Yep. Um, one of the challenges and struggles as a product manager is, you know, trying to be that, that voice of the customer and, and you've got this wealth of data from customer engagements, whether it's surveys or interviews or whatever. And so you've got, you've got some information from the customers that, you know, you can either dig deeper into or research further, but the issue becomes, um, you know, the executive team is sort of Steve jobs -ish. you know, they're like, well, the customers don't know what they want, so right. we don't really care. Yep. It's like, okay, well, what are you building then and who are you building it for and what problems are yeah. you actually solving? Right. And so, how do you have that conversation when they're the ones that sign your check? Right. Got it. So, so let's turn that problem around just slightly because I think coming at the executives and telling them they're wrong and stupid and don't understand how to build products and, and are off base it can be offensive and off-putting, right? Well, it could be career um, limiting. It could be career limiting. <laughs> so, so, so sometimes let, let's, let's take a slightly different approach, which is nobody's going to buy your solution until they understand they have a problem, right? And, and what's the problem? I, I'm going to guess that the problem is we built a bunch of things and we got them finished on time and they didn't drive revenue or customers or SAT or something, right? That, that the symptom of the problem is we're building what the executives tell us to build and it doesn't move the business, right? Now, now that's a problem. They're not going to believe you, of course, right? Right. So the next thing we have to do is we have to bring just a little bit of evidence. So if you had the code names or the releases or the project names or something of, let's say, five or six things that we built that didn't land, that didn't, didn't move the needle, right? We, we shipped them, right? Because, again, recency bias, ego here. So I'm going to come in and say, well, you know, we delivered... Oh, we delivered uh, Project Sisyphus on time, but somehow it didn't work because we have to keep pushing it up the hill, right? And then we delivered Project, um, you know, Tantalus on time, and it didn't work because nobody adopted it, right? And then we delivered, um, they're all Greek myths because they all end bad, right? right? Um, right. You know, and, and, and what I find is that if, if I, and you have to be unemotional about this, say, not you told me to do something stupid, no, we, we collectively did this thing, we got it done, and it didn't have the outcome we wanted, right? Oh, oh, well, that was a special case. Well, here's a second one that didn't have, the, oh, well, that was a special case, right? When you get to about five, it's really hard to say that's a special case, right? Because right. what we're trying to get them to do is admit there's a problem instead of leading with the solution. And the problem is we're not validating, we're not talking to enough customers, they're sampling badly, whatever the problem is, right? But nobody's going to adopt a solution from you, some product person, unless we agree it's not working, right? In the same way that nobody's going to buy your product if they don't think they need to fix the thing that your product does, right? Right. 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 So, so I'm looking for some um, non semi-non-judgmental semi way to help them see the pattern, 
right? By the way, it's identical to, well, we only had one thing this quarter that the sales team had us override the roadmap with. Well, I say, yeah, but we did that thing for Ford and then we did that thing for Deutsche Bank and then we did that thing for NASA and then we did that thing for the US government and then we did that thing for you know, Canadian Tire, whatever it is. And when I get to seven, people are a little less willing to say there was only one. Now we can now we can yeah, integrate under the cur curve and figure out how much we spent. We spent ninety percent on the wrong things. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Good sure. feedback. All right, cool. Next question is Mark uh, Coleman. Mark, if you want to take yourself off mute, Mark. There, go. Yeah, let me get you on here. Let me do that. Where you at, there, Mark? Uh, you guys can hear me okay. So there we go. All right, cool. windy. Yeah, cool. Uh, Rich, first of all, awesome, uh, awesome talk tonight. Uh, Thank you. Kind of, kind of hit home. I feel like you're working at my company. Uh, I, I am working there. at your company. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, question I have is this: uh, Let's say you walk into a situation and and you you, find, you you inherit a product, right, or a series of products, and you find out there's issues, there's quality issues. How rigid do you hold to the pie chart breakdown? Uh, where you feel perhaps like you might have to go like inbound, you know, out of balance for a bit, uh, you know, to get back in balance. Is this an okay practice you find? Or yeah. Do you, yeah. Uh, so, so that's a guideline, right? The, the, the thing I would do though, that, that I suggest my teams do is not every week because it's too, in, it's too frequent, but let's say every third or fourth week, let's look at all the tickets we closed and mark them for which of those four slices they went into and add them up, right? Um, we're not trying to tell the difference between 5% and 7% here. We're trying to tell the difference between 10% and 40%, right? So if we have a strategy that says for the next quarter, we're gonna really hammer down on bugs and quality and scalability, and we're gonna try to put 50 or 60 or 70% against it, you know, it, it's less important if it's 52 or 55, it's more important if it's 52 or 20. Right. And what I see is a lot of drift here because nobody's paying attention. And so if we inspect every third or fourth week and call it out to the team and say, we're, we're not spending according to our budget, how's this happening? Then you can do some retrospecting. Um, by the way, it's, it's identical. And again, I, I have a daughter who's all grown up, but when she was a, a, a young teen, every time a boy band came to town, she wanted me to get tickets for her and her 19 friends and forgot the fact that we did it last week also. And since we lived in San Francisco, if we did that more than once a quarter, we would have been living in a cardboard box in the mission, right? Um, so it was my job to see the pattern and it was her job to keep asking for things and not always getting them, right? So, you know, inspecting here is important. We don't wanna be rigid. We don't wanna be a-holes about it, right? But if we've agreed that we've got to overemphasize on stuff for our, key channel partners for the next quarter, then let's go look, right? And again, if, if you've got a ticketing system with some estimates in them, just take the ones that were done from two weeks ago and four weeks ago, or count them on your fingers, right? It, th th this, this isn't rocket science, this is pie charts. Awesome. Thank you so much. Good. All right, thanks, Mark, for your question. So next up, we have uh, Priscilla McCluskey. Priscilla, if you want to... Hop in. Hey, Priscilla. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Great. Well, I just yeah. want to say uh, thank you. This is hilarious and honestly very therapeutic. So I really appreciate it. Um, and I heard you speak at one of Dan's talks uh, a while ago. And Dan, I want to tell you, I've sent a couple of PMs to your course and I, I think it's really great. So, oh, great. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks. You know, um, if, if I hadn't gone into product management, I would have been a psychiatrist and it would have been the same job. <laughs> Um, well, my question is, and you touched on this a little bit earlier, but I'm wondering if um, can you get a little more specific about um, how you break up the pie chart, depending on mm -hmm. what stage your company is and how yeah. close you are to product market fit. Like we have some revenue, some customers, but we're still not exactly there. Um, so just kind of wondering how you would adjust yeah. that. Yeah, um, I, I might actually approach it the other way, which is let's start by asking what you're spending. So if, if you look back at the last month or two or whatever the appropriate time is and tag them for those four categories and find out what you're spending, right? So you don't know, right? It's the same problem as folks who are spending too much money on their household budget and they don't know where the money is going, right? The first step is to actually 
add the numbers up, right? And look at the pie chart and you're gonna have some very visceral immediate reaction that says, gosh, I didn't know that that's how we were spending our engineering, right? And, and you know, very much informed by where you are. I don't know, right? I mean, I, I have a bunch of sample charts for different stages, but it turns out that it's really hard to match, you know, some hypothetical on my end. Um, you know, if you're, if you're well in market, if you've got a lot of customers, you know, if, you, if you've hit product market fit, um, I observe that any organization that's not spending 35 or 40% on tech debt and infrastructure and bugs and whatever is going to put themselves out of business. So that's the place I start. But, you know, if you only have four customers, you don't know if you have fit, you're going to stack up the tech debt because you'll either pay it off later or you're working somewhere else anyway, right? <laughs> so, so that was a long way of saying don't really know. Um, there are a couple of posts on my site. If you drop me an email, I can probably find those for you. Great, thank you. My pleasure. Okay, next up we have uh, Michaela. Michaela had a question. Um, oh, me? There. This Michaela? Me yeah, yeah, answered. about the, Oh, you did the engineering team priorities? I oh. did. Did uh, we answer it? shared the slide, so I Excellent, found, good, good, um, awesome, great. Okay, good, okay. very cool. Cool, and there was one person who had a, um, a young product manager uh, in their hands who would ask me to ask her question for them so the young product <laughs> manager wouldn't distract the rest of us here. So, okay. which was from Sukhanyana Rajan, what kind of template do you use or found useful for doing the practical prioritization exercise? For example, ROI versus cost. Um, honestly, I use a two, or, a two column spreadsheet. <laughs> and one is, by the way, it's not ROI and cost. It's my wild swag for revenue and my, and my engineering team's even wilder swag for effort. Um, so, you know, you could put those two things in a spreadsheet. I find that useful for sorting the bottom 80%, which we're not going to spend any time on, from the top 20%, which we're really going to look into in great detail. And there's usually a bunch of other strategic issues that, that float those to the top that are not numeric. Um, by the way, I don't know if you guys know this, but all software projects run 42% late, even if you include the 42%. So I, I, don't, I don't try to get into the deep decimal places of 4.2 ROI versus 4.1 ROI because they're the same, right? I'm looking for big gaps or the top six. Yes, it's a recursive function. That's exactly right. Um, I'm looking for, another way to think about this is I only want to, my team and me to spend time on, let's say, twice as much as we think we can accept, right? So if if we can allocate 120 story points, I don't want to bother looking at anything below the 240 story point level because we're not going to get there, right? So, so I use those spreadsheets to chop the tail to get down to the, the tough ones. And if we're really only going to take six, I don't really want more than 12 or 14 on my list because my brain's not that big. So good for growth sorting. I don't see spreadsheets or templates or any other tool being the thing that's going to separate number one from number two from number three. It takes a lot of hard thinking and arguing. Great. Uh, I have a question here from someone I think that might have left, but I'll just ask it because I think it might be relevant for people. I'm working on a migration project for an internal tool. The challenge I have with my stakeholders is that some of them don't want to migrate. They have been using the tool for 20 years and they keep bringing up new features as an adoption blocker. How do you work with them to get aligned? Well, my guess, so I'm going to just make a, a wild guess here. My guess is somebody further up the organization wants this to happen, right? And we're never going to convince those folks that we're right. And we're never going to convince them that the features are enough. The answer is there's some business driver to you know, adopt the new system and throw out the old system. So I would kick that to whoever's objective it is, if it's an operations system, then the SVP of operations either has to decide this is important and take a hammer to the next few staff meetings or not, in which case let's not build it, right? But um, product managers can't make anyone do anything. We can't make them use systems unless there's some other incentive there, right? Oh, Adrian's got a good question. Let's go with yeah, that. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Adrian, Adrian take you yourself wanna... off mute. 
There you go. Hop on, bud. Why don't you ask it? Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey. Yeah. So, how do you manage the emotional drain of being a PM? Is there, I guess, you know, joining a meetup like this is fantastic. It feels like therapy. It feels like I'm a normal person now. But is there a way to to actually do it in a less draining way, or is that just kind of a pipe dream? You just manage it. Well, let me give you both answers because I'm a product manager, right? Um, so the one answer is the thing we do is really hard. It's emotionally taxing. It's intellectually taxing. And most companies were overburdened and there aren't enough of us. And it's really hard. So if you have the choice between taking care of your family and not getting divorced and leaving your kids and whatever, and being a product manager, I think one of those is more important. You better decide, right? Now, having said that, I think... Uh, I think a lot of this has to do with the organizational culture and whether you've got a champion at the top of the product team. So I believe that the job of a head of product or VP product is to enable the product managers to succeed because without it, they fail, right? And to look out for the, the health and safety of the folks on the team as if they were our kids, right? And and I think I think there's some real coaching here around trying to depersonalize it. So I love my products the way I love my kids and anybody who threatens them, it's like telling me that my kindergartner isn't as smart as the other kindergartners, right? Every parent in the room knows their kid is going to be the smartest and go on to play sports or something, right? So we're all bringing that deep emotion to the office, um, but, but we, have to, we have to relax a little bit. We have to say, yes, the folks in sales are gonna do what salespeople do. And if we don't like the way they're behaving, let's talk about comp plans, not talk smack about individual people, right? So, so for me, this is all about a sort of systems thinking, right? It's, it's not that the people hate us. Well, sometimes they do, right? But it's not that the people hate us. It's that the way we've organized things or the way we're running the company isn't ideal. Right. And that lets us back off from, I hate you. Right. And, and never darken my doorway again with a stupid ticket like you just brought me. Right. To, well, how are we going to, how are we going to help the, the support team organize itself or, we're, or organize us or set right incentives or create good processes such that we're getting more of what we want? Um, the dirty secret is we're always going to get 100 times as many requests as we can ever fill. We're always going to have an engineering team that's only 10% as big as we want, right? And we're always going to get blamed for revenue shortfalls because all the revenue upside is claimed by the sales team, right? If that offends you, well, there's, a, there's easier jobs, right? But as long as you understand that we're all doing that, you can, I think, back off a little bit and say, that's what product management is instead of that's what my product management has to be, yeah. right? And, and then, yeah, go... go um, Go find a psychiatrist on the side for a little bit of, uh, of decompression, right? Go walk in the mountains, go ride, whatever it is that makes your, brings joy to your life, make time to do it. Play the guitar, for instance. Let's just play on me, sorry. Whatever, I'm just Thank guessing. You. Or, or use your, your, your Nerf gun there, whatever it is. <laughs> Take it from the kids when they attack, yep. <laughs> Good. And, and Cassie's exactly right. It, it's one of the hardest roles. It's rewarding if it works for you. There's a lot of other really cool things to do in, in the world. If product management is not a fit, don't torture yourself. But if it's a good fit for you, great. You and I are in the same club. Yeah. And I would, I would add a caveat, which is maybe where you're working is the, is the issue, right? Maybe it's not yes. the job, but there are plenty of times when it's not you, I mean, when I was just listening to your answer to, to Adrian here, it was like, it sounds almost like it's our job to fix the systemic issues in the company. Yes, yes. You know what I mean? I, I, I agree. I would say half the companies that I know aren't good places for product managers to work and all of them are failing. Right. Um, before you join a company, go check LinkedIn or Glassdoor or something, figure out how fast the churn is of people leaving the product management team, call one of them up and find out what's going on because you don't want to join that company, right? Um, yeah. one, one other thought before I let it go. Um, there's people who love being individual contributor product managers, and there's people who are excited about being directors of repeat. They're different jobs, right? You don't promote yourself into a VP job if you think the word politics is a nasty word, right? Don't put yourself in a job that you know you're going to fail at just because you think it's a better job, right? Be true to yourself, understand yourself, 
do what brings some joy to you because otherwise it's just a grind, right? I mean, who needs this job if you cry yourself to sleep every night? Yeah. Well, and I think there are times when most product managers have had a day or a week like that. If hopefully not longer than that, but we've all been at that low point yeah. and dealt with that. I, 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 I've been to two companies in my very long career where I stayed less than six weeks. Yeah. yeah. And, and that was it on day two. It was very clear that they didn't want me doing what I wanted to do and I wasn't going to succeed right. and I wasn't interested. And thanks for the fish. Yeah. Yeah. Good Douglas Adams quote. Cool. And the, uh, and several people have used the word therapy here. And I, you know, I always joke that anytime you get a group of PMs together, PM therapy ensues. So if you are finding challenges or a low point, then by all means, you know, connect with other PMs in your company and say, is this just me? Are you seeing the same stuff from sales or engineering or reach out to PMs, you know, at other companies with our group, our Slack group, something like that, because someone else has probably dealt with what you're dealing with. A lot of times PMs think they're dealing with some unique situation or unique yeah, it's, al it's almost never unique. I mean, at, at the company level, it's usually either most of the product managers or none of the product managers having the same issue. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, um, thanks again, Rich, for sharing your advice and time with us. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Rich. Take care.